Hello and welcome everyone. Live from Cloud City, Seattle, this is This Justin. Uh, I'm Justin and this is the new Microsoft Reactor Show for developers, entrepreneurs, and our passionate technologists that want to build cool solutions that are just interesting. And uh, today is actually one of my favorite topics. It's uh, fusion development. Uh, we're going to talk a lot more about that. Uh, I am joined today by guest Gomo Limo. Uh, welcome, Gomo. Thank you, um, Justin. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Absolutely. And just a reminder to all of you that are out there, this uh, show is uh, part of our Microsoft and Microsoft Reactor Code of Conduct. Uh, basically, just be nice and uh, be friendly and patient. And uh, uh, we're going to have lots of audience participation uh, today. So be sure to log into your favorite platform uh, and get your questions ready. Uh, we're also going to play a game uh, as well. So I am excited to get started here. Uh, let's begin a little bit with an icebreaker on fusion development. So Gomalimo, tell me something that you know you currently have done in custom development, that is that you've been coding, uh, that you would mm -hmm. just like to work uh, in a low or no code solution. It would just be easier that you wouldn't have to write code or you could work with someone. Uh, what's a good example for you? Yeah, so um, for me, in, in the most cases, I'm I'm a pretty impatient guy, and especially when it comes to creating and writing software, because if I see a problem that I want to solve, I want to do it as fast as possible. So we all know that speed does not always mean quality, you know, but that's a story for another day. So when I'm building something, I usually have the end product in mind, and I would like to reach that as fast as I can. So to think, to take a step back and think about the data source, the um, structure, and how the data is coming in is something that I'm not really um, fond of. Um, so I want my data to be in a state that I can utilize. I want the data to be readily available so that I can build my solution as fast as um, possible. So all that uh, writing new APIs and cleaning up and preparing data is not something that uh, I really like doing. And I think that is why I'm so fond of the Power Platform because it gives you access to a number of um, different uh, data sources via connectors. And it's actually something that I really enjoy and I really like having um, uh, within the Power Platform. And it actually takes me back um, to when Azure's Cognitive Services was really like coming up and it was getting popular. And I'm talking about uh, cognitive uh, services because it, it's really the original middle ground for people who didn't have either the expertise or the time to build these complex AI models from scratch. So if I wanted to build something really quickly that needed a bit of AI, I could just grab a pre-built um, AI model and get that going. And so that's something that I really, really like. Yeah, Azure Cognitive Services was one of the things that I found when I was working with students in hackathons that was one of the easiest uh -huh. conversations to have that you could build AI models without necessarily being a data scientist or right. uh, writing Python. Certainly those are important things, but, but we're going to get into that. There are moments by which you want to write code, uh, and there are moments where you can utilize solutions and encourage more people uh, to participate mm -hmm. in software technology through uh, these solutions. And Goma Lima, sure. I forgot to say, like, tell us a little bit more about your professional background. You're a cloud advocate here in Microsoft, but how did you come to be part of the low and no code team? Yes, so um, actually, I am actually a recent graduate. And um, before I joined Microsoft, I was a student ambassador. I've been a student ambassador for a really long, um, long time. And when I was, um, you know, when I just started out, I was really into .NET and um, Azure because those were the tools that we were learning at, mm -hmm. at um, our college. So I started to do work workshops, write blogs, create tutorials based on, on .NET. And while my, when my um, workshops got more popular, I started to see my audience changing, right? I started to see friends and, and students coming from like the theater 
or marketing or law, right? Not mm -hmm. just the standard computer science slash IT um, background. So while I was happy teaching them .NET, and I was really glad that they were interested in um, learning, I always felt um, bad because it, it was almost as if they felt obliged to change their um, career field just to fit in. So around the same time, I discovered the Power Platform through Donna Saka, which I really liked because then I was able to take this back to these um, um, students and show them that, you know what, you could just leverage your own subject matter expertise and then supplement that and, and with the Power Platform, right? So you really understand how your business works, how your business flows. If you can use that and learn these tools, you can become a work uh, a, a really great force within um, companies. And um, ever since that, I've uh, really enjoyed learning more about the um, platform and empowering people to use the um, platform, no matter where they come from or what skill sets they um, have. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I don't know might have happened uh, a long time ago, pre uh, pre there was a pandemic. Uh, Gomo and Limo and I got to meet, uh, even though yep. we live half a world away now. Uh, but when you were part of the Microsoft Student Partner Program, which is now known as the Student Ambassador Program, if you're mm -hmm. a student out there, it's a great way to get uh, involved uh, and work with Microsoft people. Uh, but we got to meet and we got to explore technology together, if even brief. Uh, but uh, it's amazing yeah. uh, the people you meet and you never know uh, maybe two years later that we're, we're doing a show together uh, and that's incredible. <laughs> and I think one of the things that yeah. uh, really brings me uh, what I love about developer relations and working in the, the job that I'm humbled to do is, is to meet people from around the world that are passionate about technology and uh, right. you never know uh, what happens next. So uh, just great all around. Well, I'll share with you all my interesting story of low and no code. For me, it was chatbots. Uh, I've been very surprised uh, with uh, Microsoft Power Platform has come out with uh, Power Virtual Agents, which is basically a low and no code automated way to build chatbots. Uh, and indeed, the first four years that I was working with students in hackathons, we were manually building uh, chatbots through the bot framework, which is still available because, uh, of course, you need to customize bots to, to suit uh, particular use cases and scenarios. Uh, but nowadays with virtual agents, my goodness, you can uh, have conversational, you can, it can make your chatbot actually sound like a human uh, in minutes yeah. or an hour as opposed to an entire hackathon. It would take us uh, to do that as well. So something I'm just you know, super interested in and, and hope to learn a little bit more about. Awesome. Well, let's, uh, let's start to move into our audience participation side. So first of all, I just want to set the stage for Fusion Development. Uh, my guess is most of you that would attend the stream here probably are familiar. Uh, but just in case you're not, uh, when we talk about Fusion Development uh, and low and no code, uh, we are specifically talking about building software that does not require you to either use code or uh, allows you to use a lightweight or modified version of code that is more mm -hmm. like that human language uh, as opposed to writing syntactically, say if you were to write C-sharp or, or Python. Um, and one of the reasons why I selected this uh, for our third episode of This Just In is there's a lot of momentum here. Um, and indeed, uh, at Microsoft Ignite, there was a, incredible amounts of an, uh, incredible announcements about just how many people are using Fusion development and low, low, low code solutions. Right. We're going to talk about that. Um, the thing I think I personally resonate with is um, I spend a lot of my time thinking about job skills and about uh, skilling the generation of tomorrow as well as upskilling professionals. Um, and low and no code is basically a solution. Uh, that allows more people to participate. Uh, you don't have to become a data scientist or you don't have to become a software engineer, uh, which uh -huh. in kind of the theme of cybersecurity and AI and ethics, like our previous two episodes, we're reducing the barriers of entry and allowing more people on the planet to participate. And that's, I think, is what is so powerful uh, and interesting about it. Yeah. Cool. Well, we're going to play an interesting game. Let me flip through my slides here and get us set up. And we are going to play Code It, Low It, Know It. 
Uh, and for you and the audience out there, uh, we're going to go through a series of apps. Uh, and I want you, if you would, please, in your chat window, uh, to type whether you think this solution is something you code, maybe you low code it, or you don't have to code it at all. And there's no right or wrong answer here. Uh, it's really about thinking about the implications. And Goma Lima, we're going to ask you what you think about these uh, as well. Cool. So our first one is let's build a warehouse inventory management app. This amazing app allows your people in your warehouse to be able to know where a product is at any given time, make sure that it's packaged or when it's coming into the warehouse, that it's all, that people always know where it is. So what do you think? Is this a code it, low it, or know it? Yeah, this is one of the most popular use cases when talking about low code apps. Um, because it's a um, use case that really focuses on the operations of the business, the in, in internal uh, business. And wherever you think about your internal business and how it affects um, business users and all of that, you really want to be able to build those types of applications rapidly. So I think that this is very suitable for a low it type of app definitely low code, the power platform would, would do amazingly here. Excellent. And it looks like Antonio Carlos Del Silva says it sounds like a low code uh, app. Um, I would agree. I think there are some things you can do uh, that make this easy, perhaps integrating with Microsoft 365 or Dynamics 365, where you have your data set. Uh, already available. Uh, you can build UX on it to make it easy for your users to have. Um, but you may have your own business specific uh, use cases in which you might want to use uh, uh, coding uh, as well um, and custom solutions. So I call this one pretty, uh, pretty low it, if you will. All right, sure. let's, keep, let's keep going. How about let's build a new employee onboarding app? What do you think, Gomalimo? Um, I'm also, you know what, I'm leaning more towards a low-code app. Uh, you know, when it comes to, I am recently joined uh, Microsoft, so I also went through this um, onboarding process. I'm actually still going through it now. Uh, a lot of the, the places or, or the um, data sets where this information lies is like an internal SharePoint site or Microsoft Planner. All of these are available through connectors within the Power Platform. So this is something that can be built very easily um, using Power Apps. Um, so definitely a low code solution there. I agree with you. In fact, I recently used our Microsoft new employee onboarding app because I have new people uh, starting on my team today. I'm very excited uh, to welcome them. Maybe they'll watch this as part of their onboarding as their manager presents a stream or something like that. But yes, <laughs> the onboarding app is awesome here at Microsoft and it has been built with Power Platform. Next up. Let's build a tech support chatbot. I might have hinted at this one a little bit in my earlier answer. But what do you think, Gomo? Yep. Um, actually, no, this could go both ways. I think it's just it uh, depends on uh, your specific use case, your um, business requirements, what do you want to achieve. But this can be done with a low-code solution. Um, one of Power Platform's products is Power Virtual Agents, where you can rapidly build chatbots and conversational agents that sound really human-like, and they are able. You are able to integrate all sorts of different technologies like AI to quickly solve um, problems. So definitely a low-code um, one there. Yeah, and I agree with you, and I think that. This is one where quickly you get to have the foundation of a conversational chatbot, but inevitably this is gonna be the sort of scenario that you're gonna to want to customize for your own business or your own yeah. uh, use case. So chances are, now we're getting to those ones where you might have business analysts, fusion or citizen developers working with uh, coding software engineers, developers, uh, to right. make the solution even more uh, robust, absolutely. Next, we have, let's build a find the perfect size retail point of sale app. This is an incredibly common use case because think of how many small business owners there are uh, out there in the world and indeed like small and even mm -hmm. mid-sized businesses 
oftentimes don't have IT infrastructure. So what do you think about this one? Yeah, um, and I think the the um, answer is in the um, is in the use case it itself. The perfect um, size retail point of sale app. If you want to build something that is customized to your business, to your use case, to your requirements, um, then low code tools is the way to go. It's much more um, affordable than you know just outsourcing some developer to build you something that you could have done yourself. So definitely leaning more towards low code, but it can be done uh, with um, uh, traditional coding as well. Yeah, you know what I think is interesting about this one is that uh, if you want to store images, uh, images of the clothing or different sizes, uh, chances are those images are going to be stored in a blob storage. And so that mm -hmm. involves using Azure. Uh, maybe it might involve using OneDrives or Dynamics. But uh, this is one where um, I think the baseline can probably be low code, uh, but uh, inevitably has some level of customization or potentially even we're getting into machine learning uh, and doing classification matching uh, as well. So very interesting there. Moving on, let's build a fundraising progress dashboard. This is an amazing scenario in my, my own. I have children, and they are uh, they are currently doing a fundraiser in their school right now. And most elementary schools probably don't have robust fundraising um, infrastructure. So what do you think about this one? Yeah, this um, sounds like a the um, type of app where you would like to have some sort of visualizations, you know, looking at data, comparing data, analyzing it. So um, definitely something that uh, could be built uh, using a bit of Power BI. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, this is an interesting yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah, this is where I think Power BI really comes in, doesn't it? Yeah. Excellent. For sure. All right, now we're going to get a little harder. Let's build a mobile game with collision detection. I don't know. I've actually had a chance to do this myself back when I was uh, working more uh, in the web wow. with HTML5 uh, and that. Uh, in fact, uh, for those of you who don't know it, I worked on the Internet Explorer team for a little while. That was a time long ago before the Edge browser. Uh, and so we were talking about HTML5 and Canvas, and collision detection was one of the first scenarios. But what do you think about low and no code here? Yeah, this, I think most people would uh, gravitate towards a um, traditional coding um, solution here. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should uh, really write out any um, low code platforms. Um, actually, uh, I know someone, his name is Brian Dang, and he actually makes quite a number of games on the Power platform, right? He really stretches what most of us believe are the power platform's limits. And I think with just the right amount of um, determination, you are able to do anything that you want to do. Of course, you will have to try and utilize some sort of custom um, development, you know, maybe um, work with a, pro, with a pro dev to build you some custom code components. Um, there are a lot of moving parts here, um, but I think uh, what whatever works from you, uh, you will be able to get this um, solution done. Absolutely. In fact, I just uh, typed in the chat window Brian Dang's recent tweet there as well. And so pushing the limits of what's possible with low and no code. Of course, there's some custom code in that. But um, what prevents us from building a game uh, with low, no code solutions. In fact, you could even deploy to the app stores, uh, iOS or Android or others using low, no code uh, solutions mm -hmm. as well. And then finally, we'll finish our last one with a scenario I never thought could be possible, but let's build an anomaly detection monitoring system. So clustering or classification with images. Uh, what do you think? You know, this can go both ways, uh, to be honest. Um, when you think about low-code um, solutions, it's not just using the power of platform. You can obviously supplement that with other tools, um, other AI models, things like Azure and stuff. So if you do want to try and um, maybe build like the um, front end, the UI using Power Apps, and then uh, using Power Automate to bridge and to create uh, work workflows that bridge between your app and external. Um, services hosted on Azure or, or something like that, you, then you are able to do 
just that. If you want to go the traditional coding routes, that's also fine. Um, again, this is also a flexible one. Um, if you want to, if you're looking for more custom, something more custom, something more more ro ro robust, then you should be able to do just that with cross team collaborations. Yeah, definitely. Very cool. Well, I hope you liked our, our game there. We're just warming up. Uh, I'll pause for a quick moment. Uh, uh, Antonio Carlos da Silva in our chat window has a question. What is the relationship between fusion development uh, and, uh, assuming I'll add the question there, and power uh, automate? Uh, Gomalima, what do you think about fusion development and power automate? Yeah, Power Automate is one of the products of the broader Power Platform. It's a really a way to build um, work uh, workflows, to build like backends with uh, workflows and RPA and stuff. So um, if you are working in a Fusion team and um, let's say you're a citizen dev, you're more than likely the person who, who has identified the um, problem. You've built what the app would look like. But, and, but then you also understand what data the app will, would need. Then you would consult a pro dev to maybe build you a custom connector, some sort of backend API, or to maybe uh, create a AI model and host it on um, Azure. Then you use Power Automate as that in between to bring in the um, data, probably calling it through some sort of HTTPS and then bring that into Power Apps. Um, so Power Automate is actually maybe one of, if not the most important tool within Fusion Teams because it's able to bridge those two worlds of low code and, um, uh, and pro dev development. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think Power Automate is one of my favorite because it is coding like in the sense that you are automating. And so um, that's the spirit of fusion. Uh, the fusion by by the what the word suggests is that we're bringing more people together. Uh, we're going to talk about some of those job roles uh, in a minute here. Mm -hmm. uh, but in in fact, I think you know, uh, Antonio, your your question also reminds me of a thing that uh, even though we're calling this fusion development now in this uh, time in tech, um, the idea of people being uh, low, no code, and coming together with developers. Uh, has existed yeah. for some time in the tech industry. Uh, if you think about SharePoint or Word macros or Excel scripting, um, some of the stuff I was doing in, in my school, in grade school, uh, before I learned how to code was Excel formulas. And I was just absolutely amazed by the idea that I could change a value in one Excel uh, uh, cell and then have that automatically change. And to some degree, that is a flavor of Power Automate, right? Excel was acting yeah. as the automation based on all the assumptions of me changing one cell. And so um, mm -hmm. this technology is not new. What is truly transformative about it is the cloud native aspect of it, that uh, we now have the ability to have ubiquitous data and limitless compute through the cloud. And so the, the amount of things that people can realize with low and no code solutions is, is truly orders of magnitude um, more influential than maybe what it was uh, years ago uh, as well. Right. Well, uh, let's start going into some Q&A. So Goma Limo and I, we were talking a little bit before this episode, and we want to, I think, start to kind of address the, the question of like, are, uh, are low and no code solutions really becoming a thing? That's the title of this, uh, this episode. Um, so tell me a little bit more, like, um, what what is the state of adoption in low and no code, and uh, you know have we reached a, rip, a tipping point uh, in these solutions? Yeah, so um, everyone has uh, probably heard this um, by now, but five hundred million apps need to be built by the year twenty twenty five, right? And that is more apps than in the last forty years, um, which is a re um, a really big number. So now the question is, do we have enough people to meet that demand, right? And the simple answer to that question is no, right? Building software from the ground up takes a lot of time. So local tools are there to help supplement and bridge the gap and further drive digital transformation. And this is why we are on a mission to enable anyone, no matter what their background or skill level is, to take part and leverage the power of the power platform to do just that, right? 
So stats are there to tell us their story. As we stand right now, there are 1.4, there is a 1.4 million global shortage of pro of pro devs, and this will increase to 4 million by the year 2025. So companies are seeing this, and now they are starting to embrace fusion teams. All right, 84% of orgs in companies have these fusion teams. And if you're asking yourself why, it's, it's simply because it just works. Teams that consist of not just pro devs, but also citizen devs, IT and business admins, frontline workers, all coming to work as a unit. So, yeah, company, yeah sorry. No, no, please, please continue. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that companies are starting to understand that this new digital delivery model is working and that they need to capitalize on the core strengths of all members of these teams. Um, the other day, I was reading a, re a report from Slash Data, which cites that about a third of pro devs are reporting using local tools, so they understand the need to produce results quickly. Uh, another interesting piece of data we came across is that the usage of local tools um, are being most adopted amongst pro devs um, who have between one to five years of experience. Right, and of course, people could interpret this in different ways, but my perspective is that there's a gradual increase of people seeing this as a first choice approach. Um, and, uh, and I'm sorry, like I, do, I, I don't wanna spend uh, too much time on this question, but a colleague of mine, Joe Camp, um, he regularly like updates me on the number of job postings related to low code and the power platform. And there's thousands, actually tens of thousands of jobs that contain keywords like low code or power apps. And of course, this is increasingly evident in regions such as the US or the UK, but also in industries spanning from financial services all the way to healthcare. So it's really great to see the rate in which people are embracing um, fusion teams. Yeah, I think you make a really a good point, Gomalimo, on uh, your, your point around developers that are traditional software engineers or developers that are adopting low and no code solutions. And I think one of the things that I internalized from that is that uh, if I am a software engineer and I am building with code first, um, it's good to yeah. know what I don't need to build because of low and no code solutions. Um, it's kind of like a framework or library in JavaScript or Python or other things where right. the developers don't want to reinvent the wheel. You want to use what the community has already produced. Um, and so mm -hmm. low and no code solutions are kind of similar. Like why, why go ahead and build that UX when you can work with a team to do that, uh, where you as the developer can focus on the API or the service you need to write uh, in order to enable uh, that. Uh, app. Mm -hmm. sure. you know, the other thing I think is really interesting here is the middle stat on this slide. 43% of fusion team leaders report outside of corporate IT. Um, I think this is interesting because it kind of dispels perhaps one of the myths that I have heard is that, you know, low and no code apps are all about IT and building solutions internally because you have all the data inside your organization. Um, that's true, but um, it it also shows that people are exploring well outside the IT space uh, as well for uh, applications that are customer facing uh, as well. So very interesting mm -hmm. stuff here as well. All right, well, let's keep going. Um, let's talk a little bit more about tech intensity and job roles here. Um, so, yeah. uh, so in terms of fusion development teams, I wanted to spell the myth of like, who are these fusion developers? Who, who are they? Uh, what job roles do they perform and how do they work together? And so, Gomalimo, can you tell us a little bit more about your perspective on how these teams do come together and work on a day to day basis? Yeah, so tech intensity, our, our CEO really talks about this a lot. And if you break it down, it boils down to three aspects, right? The ad adoption of tech, the capability of people who use the tech and the trust that the organization has in deploying the tech. Mm -hmm. So if you really look at it as a whole, it's about breaking down the structures that separate these teams and enabling cross team collaboration and productivity. So, and this 
right, follows into the uh, next part of your question, which was who is in a fusion team and what sort of skills do they have, which in turn enables effective teamwork. If you think about the process at a high level, everyone contributes within their comfort level and skill set. Business and IT domain uh, experts from across the company identify and collaborate to find solutions to company-wide problems. Business users and frontline workers, aka the citizen devs, can create power apps that directly address and solve a problem. And then the pro dev team focuses on providing data and complex logic that the power apps or even power automate workflows can consume. And it can easily and quickly manage uh, rollouts to get the power apps into the hands of the company users very quickly. This is something that is uh, usually managed by IT and business admins, but now um, because of the layer of uh, security and the extensibility of the power platform that can do it for you as well. So it's, re it's really cool to um, think about. Yeah, I agree. And one of the things that I think, um, so I'll switch to a, a slide here that I had uh, that really kind of helped me understand this a little bit too, is um, the term citizen dev is, I think, a relatively recent uh, term, certainly something I've heard more recently. Um, but it kind of begs the question, like, what does a citizen dev um, build? And um, with Power Platform, you can build UX and you can automate workflow uh, you can consume the APIs that your developers are creating and such, and you can yeah. release these apps directly uh, to popular app stores as well. And so just think about how much um, the citizen dev can do, um, you know, that perhaps a professional developer used to have to do, which, you know, kind of mm -hmm. makes it uh, much easier for the pro dev to do awesome things like build services or build machine learning modules uh, models if you're a, uh, a data scientist uh, as well. But uh, uh, there's also a role for IT here. And so I, again, I really think it's awesome, uh, new skills for IT uh, decision makers and administrators to learn uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, so Gomalimo, you have also uh, wanted to share a bit more of a, a demo with me and, and really talking a little bit more about how does someone use a uh, power platform, particularly if you are a traditional software engineer. Uh, and I saw, I heard you use the word earlier in our session, connectors. And so let's, right. uh, let's demystify a little bit more about what uh, these connectors are. And if I'm a citizen mm -hmm. developer, how I consume them. And if I'm a traditional software engineer, how I build them. Does that sound good? No, that sounds great. All right, let me switch to your screen here. There we go. Okay. Uh, is everything good? Okay. Yeah. So you were asking about connectors. Um, so I think the um, simplest way is to say that connectors enable you to connect apps, data, and devices in the um, cloud. So in the Power Platform, we have connectors giving citizen devs connectivity to over 500 cloud services, content services, databases, and APIs. And this number grows almost daily, right? We have programs like the Independent Publisher Connector Program, which enables anyone to build your own connector to any service, and then you put that up on GitHub so that anybody can use them. A good thing to note is that there is something called um, the on-prem data gateway where anyone can seamlessly connect to your own on-prem SQL or SharePoint data store um, that you have within your company. So naturally, when there is a use case where you need to connect to data that is not publicly available, for example, you can create your own custom connector that acts as a wrapper around a RESTful API that connects directly to your company data. And there are various ways for you to create a custom co connector. One is directly from within Power Apps through a guided wizard experience. You may also import an open API file or from an open API URL, or you can create one from within the Azure portal in Azure API management, which is what I'll be showing you um, in just a minute now. 
so without any further ado, I think it's best to just uh, go ahead with the demo. Yeah, go for it. So, sure. So we, we don't have any questions in the chat yet. Or... Um, I will I will work and see if there are any new questions. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and do your demo, and I'll make sure that uh, uh, questions are answered. I did hear one about citizen devs, so I'll, I'll answer that while uh, Gomalimo is uh, sharing here. Sure. So um, how are we going to go about this very short demo? Of course, I'm looking at time, so I don't, I don't want to take too much of your time here. So let's look at the um, scenario that we have here. So in-person conferences are fast approaching, and your company allows employees to pick their top three conference destinations so they can allocate resources and make sure everyone is happy. Your task as a pro dev is to build a custom connector to the internal company approved destinations so the users can make their choice within a power app. It's a very simple um, use case. Let's see if we can go ahead and build a custom connector for that um, purpose. So for this demo, um, I built a web API project with .NET Core and um, Visual Studio 2022. And by the way, I'm loving Visual Studio 22. So far, it's a really great tool. Um, I've also added all the necessary models for the destinations, which include the model class, as well as the DB context, which represents the database. And I've also added a DTO class for mapping purposes. And of course, I've added a controller uh, with methods that represents our API operations. Then I went ahead and added and configured Swagger definitions. Um, so Swagger allows you to describe the structure of your API so that machines can read them. What's cool about this is that I can also use it to test my APIs locally. And when, I'm, when I've published them to Azure API management, it will be able to read the defin definitions. So I've added that to my program.cs file in my solution there. So now, with this basic API build, we'll be going through on how we publish the web API to Azure Management uh, Service or within Visual Studio. I know that some people might prefer um, going into Azure for more hands-on experience where you can customize um, certain attributes. However, for the sake of time and the demo, we will be doing all that in Visual Studio, right? further driving home the idea that pro devs never have to leave the tools that they are comfortable with. So I really like the fact that I can build my API in Visual Studio and publish to an app service and to Azure API management all within the um, screen here. So let us go ahead now and right click publish. We've already built our, um, our solution here. And then what we're going to be doing is, oh, sorry. Sorry, I um, didn't mean to. Let's go ahead and just play that again. Sorry about that. OK, I'm just uh, showing off this. OK, there, uh, there you go. So we've already built our, um, our API here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to right click publish, right? So we're going to right click on the solution name here, the travel.api, go to publish, then we'll click on Azure. And as you know, there are many different ways for us to um, publish. We'll click on Azure. And then after we, we click on Azure, we'll click on next. And then we're going to be selecting the Azure app service of your choice, uh, Windows, Linux. Um, for the sake of this demo, I'll be choosing um, Windows, then we're going to be creating a new app service, right? We've logged into our Azure account, and now we need to create a app service instance, right? So the create app service dialog will pop up, and then we need to configure certain attributes like the app name, the resource group, um, and all of that. So let's uh, go, uh, go ahead and uh, um, rename the app name if we need to you can leave it as a um, default it's really fine 
And then what we're going to do next is after we've renamed named that to travel API de employ, we're going to put that in a new resource group. And for this uh, resource group, I think I'm just going to name that uh, episode three demo because this is the third episode of this just in. And then uh, once I've renamed that, uh, we'll just uh, click on create. So let's go there, click on create. I'm leaving the hosting plan as is, and then we'll just wait for that dialogue to unclose. So once that is created, that'll take a bit of a um, while here. At this point, we would, we could go into Azure and add the API to Azure API management, but I'll just continue right here within Visual Studio to show you how easy um, it actually is. So we'll go to next to API management. And then uh, we have a, a few um, things we need to do here. The first thing we do is we need to create an a, a API management instance. So we'll name the API. We will um, create a new instance of the service there. And then at the end, we'll put in the API URL suffix. So we'll just click on new, then a dialog should pop up. We can leave everything as is. If you want to rename the API, that's totally up to, to you. Then once that that is done, we'll click on OK. And then add in the URL suffix. I'll just put this as version 1 because it's, it is the, the first version of this API. Once that is done, we'll click on, cre on Create. So you need to take note that creating an, an API in uh, API Azure management takes a bit of time. But because this is a demo, I'll just skip through all, uh, all of that. So now we have our API in, uh, instance within Visual Studio there. And then we can just click on um, Finish. So as you can see, we were talking about how uh, Microsoft Cloud is about is, is something that really caters to everyone within a Fusion team, right? You do not have to leave the tools that you are comfortable with. And I did everything here within Visual Studio. So when we click on Publish, it'll publish to both Azure App Service, and then it will publish to an API in um, Azure API Management. So once that is published, then we can then go into Azure and look at our API there. So actually what I'll do now is I'll exit the, the slideshow here. And then let's go into Azure. So this is my Azure portal. I'm in the resource group that I created inside Visual Studio. Then let me click on this Azure API management service instance here. Then that will open up. And you will be able to see the newly deployed API um, within uh, that we deployed in Visual Studio. On the left pane here, let's go to APIs. So we can see the number of APIs that we have. If you remember, we call that API travel. So let's just click on that. And because of the Swagger definitions that are configured within Visual Studio, it has all the operations already here available to us. So we can click into those. We can test it if we want. So let's actually do a quick test now. We just uh, click on the get operation there. And then we should have all the data in our um, API. So again, if you go back to the scenario that we talked about earlier, these are all the approved destinations um, within the um, company. So I created an API um, on Visual Studio, de deployed that to Azure App Service and um, API management. And then from here, I can go on and create a custom connector to be used within a Power App. So how we do that is we can just right click on this API, click on Create Power Connector. All right, that will take a bit. And then it has chosen the API. 
uh, let's change the let's do the API display name. So I'll just put travel API. And then this is a very important one here. If you're working with Power Apps or the Power Platform, you are likely to have a whole host of in environments that are available to you. So always make sure that you are going to be publishing the connector to the right in, in the environment. And it's very important because you need to have an environment that is um, configured with a Dataverse instance. Right, so I'm, I've chosen the right in, in environment there, and then I'll click on Create. So that shouldn't take too long uh, to create that the connector. So we'll just wait a bit there. And then once that's created, we can then just go into our Power App and integrate this new custom connector. So let's very just wait cool. for that. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. There you go. The API has been successfully exported. We can now use the travel API. So let's go into Power Apps. Uh, you can access this page by going to make.powerapps.com. And that would take you to this landing page here. Again, we need to make sure that we're in the environment that we deploy the API to, um, making sure that it's also the environment that has a Dataverse instance. So let's go within our data here. If we go to custom connectors, we should be able to see the custom connector that we just created not too long ago here. So there it is here. Of course, you can uh, you, you can go into it and configure it a bit more. There's a bunch of different options here to add security. Um, you can add some uh, custom code if you want. There's all these different things. You can even test it um, if that's something you want to do. But of course, you can also do that in the Azure portal as well. So we're not going to be doing anything there. Let's just open our app. So let's go to home, um, travel demo app. Let's edit that. So now this would be an app that is built by the citizen dev, right? So everything that you've just seen me do was done by the pro dev. I created the API to lead to a um, to data within the company. I've uh, created a custom connector that wrapped around that API for the citizen dev to use in their app. So as a citizen dev, I've made this uh, very basic power app here. Obviously, there's a few errors because we need our data. So there's a few ways that we can do this. The one way is on the left here. If you go to this data icon here and we add our data, right? So there's a bunch of uh, different data sources there. We'll go to connectors. We can either just look through the list or um, because we know the name, we should just be able to search for that connector there. So I'm just going to quickly copy this subscription key. I was supposed to do that in um, in Azure, but uh, sorry about that. Let me just do that now. Hopefully it, hopefully it just shows the dots when you do this versus the actual subscription key. Oh, yeah, true, true. Let me, let me um, do, uh, do, uh, do that here. Sorry about that. No, here, let me, here, I'm going to switch to Windows there. Hi, we're here. Okay. Pay no attention to the subscription <laughs> key. It's about to be copied and pasted into the window there. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I uh, mistakenly skipped that step in Azure, in the Azure um, API. Well, well, I think it's great that you can do it in both. That's that's one of the things that I'm learning from your demo, uh, Golimo, is that, that you're able to um, see this API and be able to configure it in both Azure and uh, Power Platform, uh, Power Apps in this case, and that's uh, right. it's quite interesting. And um, there are use cases by which you would want to configure it as a citizen developer, and there are use cases by which you would want to tune it further um, as a professional developer. And indeed, as you were showing some of the security features, if you're an IT professional, you can also write policy and otherwise ensure that the data is secure, um, having that sort of customer trust. So it's pretty uh, pretty interesting stuff. Yep. All right. Yes. Yeah, so I'm window back. Back on. Great. All right. Perfect. So we have the 
connector here. And it's just a simple case of um, binding that to our um, gallery here. So we have City Gallery here. So what we can do is we look for the items um, uh, property here. And it's just a case of calling the, the API and calling whichever operation you need then. In this case, we'll be calling the get destinations um, operation there. Let's wait for that to load in. So that should load in. And I've already pre, um, uh, I've used some of the formulas here to pre-populate some of these. For example, the image and the city and the country. Wow. So one thing I wanted to just quickly show you here is that if you go to the unselect property here, right, and we see this, this is what we were talking about earlier on uh, that we briefly t uh, touched on, the Power FX um, low-code language, which is loosely based on Excel formulas and um, stuff. So this is a gallery. So let's actually play this. Um, and if I click on certain cities, then it goes into a um, into another screen there, which and you can go back and forth um, however you, you see fit there. So obviously, when I click on a city, something needs to happen. It needs to grab that specific, specific, specific data of that single city and then send it to the second screen. So if you look at this function here, yeah, it's a very simple function. There's mm -hmm. sets. So sets is usually something where we, we are setting global variables. So a variable that I've chosen that, or I've created a selected city. And then I've hit city gallery dot selected, right? So city gallery is the name of this gallery. And then this dot uh, selected here takes the selected city. So if I click on London, it knows that to bring in all the information pertaining to London and store it in selected um, city. Wow. Pro devs who might be wondering, why can't I just do a call to the API, uh, probably using the, um, the, uh, the um, city's ID? I think because we want to look at the performance here, right? So if we store all the data that we've already called into a variable or collection, then we are able to access that quickly within Power Apps. If we keep making calls to the API, that might make the app a bit um, slow there. So yeah. that's a, yeah, so that's the first command there. Once you have grabbed that city, then we just navigate to the detail screen where we are able to see um, the details of that specific city. And of course, you, you can extend this to whatever you need. We can create further API calls to maybe add certain cities to favorites. The, the um, limits are really between the people who are creating the app. And obviously from what I've shown you from the pro dev making the API to publishing the API in Azure to creating a connector that the citizen dev can use. I really feel like this is a, um, a very simple way to show you how Fusion Teams uh, can work to, together. Yeah, that was really interesting, Gomalimo. That's a great example and uh, kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, I had a chance to watch some of the Microsoft Ignite uh, sessions, including your own, where you were building with Power Apps. And uh, indeed, uh, this is very complimentary. So for those of you out there, if you want to check out more of uh, some of Gomalimo's uh, demos, check out the Microsoft Ignite session on Power Apps. Uh, and then also our uh, colleague Chloe Condon did an incredible uh, what's uh, new in Power uh, in Power Platform as well, where she did a demo using AI and custom vision service in addition to Power Apps uh, as well. So there's really a ton of flexibility um, here. Very cool. Well, uh, we're just up to a few more minutes of our stream here. I, I want to end really with talking about uh, the job skills of Fusion developers uh, and that, and really kind of focusing more on like what, what are the sort of skills uh, should 
uh, tomorrow's Fusion developers be acquiring in order to participate and contribute more to this movement? So what do you think, Gomolimo? What, what are some uh, key areas to go and get started on? Yeah, this is actually um, quite a tricky question in the sense of um, there's no specific box set of skills that one person should know. If you're in a fusion team, you know, like pro devs are really starting to understand the um, importance of understanding business needs. And then obviously citizen devs are really starting to understand the importance of knowing maybe a few coding skills, a um, few uh, uh, terms there. So really, if you want to work effectively in a, in a fusion team, really know your domain pretty well understand how your business operates, how your business works, and then try to look for the best types of um, tools that can um, help you achieve the goals of creating applications that solve these um, issues. Um, Microsoft has a bunch of uh, various uh, learning parts that can help you achieve just that. Um, if you want to learn about uh, leveraging um, any tools within the power the power platform, you can do do that. If you're a pro code dev and you want to really understand what this low code world is, how you can leverage low code tools in your everyday life, um, there's resources available to do just that as well. I really like the fact that even though these these people are working together, it's not in it's not in like um, silos right they are not working in isolation they're really understanding the needs of each, of each other and how they can complement each other's skill sets yeah i couldn't agree more i think uh the idea that uh, teams can work together and that um you know i mean especially um it takes real expertise to know um you know scenario if you are building a fitness app then you need uh, to consult uh, fitness experts that are part of building that up. And indeed, uh, tomorrow's fitness experts can become uh, low and no code developers in partnership with software engineers. And so um, I think it's incredible. And uh, it's something that I look forward to seeing what uh, people will build in the coming years uh, with Fusion. It's not something I think going to go away. I think it's going to be uh, even more um, in the future. Um, I forgot to mention one thing as you were demoing uh, PowerFX too, uh, is that my right. absolute favorite announcement at Ignite was the fact uh, that PowerFX is uh, open source. Uh, and so if you all want to check it out, we have a link here on the screen, aka.ms slash PowerFXOS uh, as well. Uh, but also documentation. Um, I personally took the Microsoft Learn module at the top there of transforming your business apps. Uh, just to refresh my own skills in it uh, as well. And so there's a lot to learn and something that you can pick up really quickly and just be experimenting uh, with, right. uh, with relative ease. And that's what makes it awesome. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm really, um, speaking of what you just said, I'm really excited to see what the Pro co um, Code uh, community does now that PowerFX is uh, open source, right? Mm -hmm. So they can go in and, um, and uh, look at the um, source code right now. And I'm re I really can't wait to see what people build. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Gomalimo, for being our guest today. You're clearly an expert in the space, uh, especially as evidenced by your Ignite session last week as well. Uh, I really enjoyed this one, getting to know you and getting to know uh, a fusion development more as a topic. Um, so uh, for those of you out there, this is just our third episode of This Just In, but we have even more coming. Uh, we're going to skip next week. Uh, it is the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday. And so um, I actually have the honor of uh, presenting about AI at a high school that I'm volunteering at. So we're going to skip next week, uh, but then jump right into green and sustainable software the state of mixed reality, and what's new in quantum computing. So some cool stuff uh, on the horizon there. But be sure to check out more about fusion development. And thank you again for uh, attending. I will leave the slide up uh, to the top of the hour since we're streaming on Learn TV as well. So thank you again, Gomo. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Cheers.